Hi, it's Florian and you are listening to podcast Świat Okiem Biegacza. Today my guest is Mike Foppen, one of the best runners in Europe on 5K and 10K. Mike, it's really pleasure to have you on podcast. Thank you for accepting invitation. And first of all, uh, can you introduce yourself? Who are you? Where are you from? And why did you became did you become um, pro runner? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You told me I have some Polish fans, so I'm really happy to uh, do this for a Polish podcast. Um, so my name is Mike Foppa. I'm 24 years old. I live in the Netherlands, Nijmegen. Um, I've been running for 14, maybe 15 years, so I started pretty young. Um, and I always had some guys in my group who were like kind of professional, so I always looked up to them. And yeah, I was hoping to uh, one day be the same as them. And yeah, I've just been training very consistently for the past years, trying to reach that level. And now, yeah, it seems that I, I, I came to the level where I can live like a professional athlete. So that's also what I do in daily life. Um, I'm just a full-time uh, pro athlete right now. Uh, I've studied in the past psychology um, and I finished my, my uh, bachelor study and half my master. But yeah, now, of course, for the Olympics, the full focus is on, uh, is on running. And I think people would describe me as a bit of a running nerd um, because I know a lot of things about different runners and I really like to talk to other runners and talk about training and talk about their PBs. And I know for a lot of athletes, I know exactly their PBs on every distance. So yeah, I think that's the, the best way to describe me. Okay, so it's even better that we can talk about training, about how do you train, how other Dutch uh, runners train. So uh, we are talking uh, on Friday and on uh, Wednesday you had really really nice run in Lieben uh, on uh, five uh, or, or on three thousand meter uh, meters. Uh, how do you find this race? Uh, are you happy that you have new uh, personal record and Dutch? You are new uh, Dutch uh, record holder on three uh, thousand meters. It was a bit of a strange race because it was a really fast race. It was some Ethiopians in the front who almost ran a world record. Uh, and it's always strange to be in a race like that because I have my race of my own for the national record and with the other European guys. So, yeah, it's a bit like there's two races in one race, which made it a bit chaotic. And then they had the lap counter wrong. So it said we had six laps, uh, laps to go, but it was actually seven. And I noticed that, but some guys in my group didn't know. So they... Uh, Yeah, with 1K to go, they started speeding up and it was just chaos in our group. A lot of people uh, moving around. But yeah, they're really good last 400 meters. And then I actually saw that I was going to break my PB and going to break the national record. And of course, you get a little extra boost from that. But in one way, it was also a bit expected because I had a really good track season outdoors. Um, and yeah, I, I knew it was possible to break uh, the old national record, 744 it was. But it's still an honor because the guy who actually had the record was one of the best or maybe the best miler or 1500 meter runner from the Netherlands ever. He also has the national record on the 1500 meters. I think it's 332. So yeah, he was just a, a legend or he still is a legend in the Netherlands. Um, so it's always an honor to break a record from, from someone like that. Because when I look at your results, 2020 was the best year of your career. Just, you know, it was the milestone and you became, you know, the really, really good runner. And, you know, before this uh, race in Lieven, uh, what trainings uh, have you done and um, how did you know that you are in good shape? I've actually been in good shape for a really long time. So after the summer, I took some time off, maybe a few weeks. Um, and then I was, I went to Fondremeux in France for altitude camp, but I had to fly home after six days because there was a new lockdown. Um, and then I've, I've stayed in the altitude tent here in this room. Um, and I could just see in my training that was getting better and better. And I actually did some tests at the treadmill as well, uh, kind of lactate tests. And we could also see that my values were definitely increasing. Um, and then 31st of December, I did a 10K in Madrid. It was a pretty heavy course with some hills and um, it was pretty windy, but I still ran 28.14, which, yeah. As a runner, you need those kind of test moments to see how your shape is building. And after that, I went to South Africa for another uh, altitude camp. And I just trained consistently and very good for four weeks. Nothing really special, but I knew if I come 
with or I leave to South Africa with 28 14 in my legs then when I come back from altitude I'm, I have to be better than that um, and I know I'm better at the track and better at a bit shorter distance maybe like 3k 5k actually I was hoping to do a bit more specific work before the 3000 meters but I had some problems with uh, uh, an injury in my groin that I've had for a while so I couldn't do as much specific work as I wanted to but I know for a fact that with a lot of base training, you can still um, run a really fast 1500 or 3000 meters or 5000 meters. They often say that the 1500 meters is still like 85% aerobic. So they mean um, of base training and slow runs, you can still run a good 1500 for 85%. And the last 15% is the speed and the anaerobic part. It was a bit expected, but uh, yeah, if you always have to do it and... It's always, I said to my girlfriend before the race that I was still very nervous because you never know how you respond on the training camp and maybe you did a bit too much, maybe a bit overtrained. You don't know. It's it's different every time. So, uh, Are you planning uh, another uh, meeting? Uh, are, are you going to another meeting? Uh, because, you know, in uh, just two or three weeks, uh, there will be a European Championship in Torun, in Poland. Are you planning to start there? I'm racing next weekend, uh, Nationals, here in the Netherlands, probably 3,000 meters, but I, I will try to see it as a good training because five days after that, uh, 26th of February, I'm actually racing uh, um, 5,000 meters outdoors because I still have to qualify for the Olympics. I ran the standard in Monaco this year, but because of the COVID situation, um, it didn't count as a standard, so I have to do it again. And Jimmy Gresset, the French uh, track runner, uh, organized his own race which i'm running uh, so hopefully i can understand it there and then after that of course the plan is to come to torun and and do the european championships and in torun you are planning uh, 3000 meters or, or you know also uh, 50 50 uh, hundred meters also uh, i think i will only do the the 3000 meters i think it's also where my chances are highest for a medal um, the level in europe is just really high at the moment so it's going to be very interesting european championships and I was actually at European Indoor Champs uh, two years ago in Glasgow. Yeah, like you said, 2020 was a bit my breakthrough year. And 2019, I just finished, didn't feel so comfortable at that level yet. I was, I think I placed 15. I didn't make the final. And I just felt like they were toying with me or something. I, I didn't have the power to, yeah, to finish fast and be with the big guys. And now I find it's a feeling that I made that step towards the European top. Um, so I just want to prove that I belong at that level and if that's an eighth place or a third place or a gold medal we'll see but i just want to prove that i belong at that level especially uh, indoor when you know there is so much so little space and you know you have to have very uh, big experience you know to know when you, you need to speed up yeah, where, need, where you need to be. So, yeah, this is uh, very tough. And what about Olympic plans? 5K or 5,000 meters or uh, also uh, 10,000 uh, meters? Um, for now, the plan is still only 5,000 meters. So I first want to qualify for the 5,000 meters. And maybe once I've done that, I can try a 10,000 meter on a track. I've only done it once in my life um, this year. I still, I still think that the 5,000 meter fits me better at this moment. But I actually also came pretty close to the standard for the 1500 meters. I don't know. I think a combination at the Olympics itself is pretty hard. Um, it's, a, it's a hard schedule if you want to do both. And like I said, my main event is um, uh, the 5000 meters. So I only want to focus on that for making the final. And then maybe if I'm out of the 5000 meters, I can try another distance. But I don't know about the schedule if, if it's even possible. So I guess we'll uh, we'll see that. But I would definitely like to try a fast 10,000 meters uh, because I think I'm slowly going up to the longer distances. And what was your reaction when you uh, get to know that, oh my gosh, uh, Olympics are cancelled or postponed on uh, 2021? What was your reaction? It, it, was, it was a hard period. Um, in the Netherlands, the restrictions were pretty bad, so I couldn't train with my team. I couldn't see my coach, and my girlfriend's actually from Sweden, and she was in Sweden at the time, so I was alone here. And slowly, everything started to get cancelled. I think it was—I don't know exactly when it got cancelled, but I think it was like March or April. Um, yeah, it was just a, a hard period, but I had nothing else to do, so I just kept on training hard, hoping 
that there would be other races uh, that I could prove myself because I, I was I felt that period that I was already getting better and better. Um, but of course, uh, a lot of people told me, ah, but for you it's not so bad. The Olympics are postponed because you're still young and you're growing. And I, I agree with them a bit. But on the other hand, I was ready this year. I was ready to run the stand i was ready to go to olympics um so it was hard to get out of that mindset but once i got out of that mindset okay it's next year i started setting new goals and uh actually had one of the best periods of my life training wise so from march till july or june every training i did was just good and i yeah never ran so much actually uh without feeling tired so I had a really good training period, and that was also the the build up I needed for that uh, good track season. Uh, you said that you were training wise. Uh, what do you mean about this? Normally, you're um, racing. People want to race because racing is fun. But this time we didn't have a choice, so we had to train. And I think a lot of athletes uh, in a normal season don't take enough time to actually build a good base. Uh, so you don't even have to do much quality work, but just a lot of base stuff and make your uh, mileage not nothing extreme at least not for me um and from there you start doing more specific stuff and from there you start thinking about racing and normally it's really easy to say ah i'm just gonna try this race because it's fun um so with wise or with right i meant that for me it worked out perfectly that i couldn't race actually because this gave me the time to have this perfect preparation where i First, did two months of base training, nothing too crazy. So I was running maybe 140k a week, uh, no 200k or like crazy amounts you sometimes see from other athletes. And I wasn't doing hard track workouts. I didn't put on my spikes. I was just doing a lot of base stuff, hoping or basically being ready for racing with four weeks away. So I just tried to be ready. Um, how do, how do I explain this? If the, if the racing started again, I wanted to be ready four weeks after. So uh, that's a bit the shape I was building. Um, and this took a bit longer than I hoped because, yeah, the race started, when was it? End of July, beginning of August again. But yeah, this gave me that long period to, to really build a good base and it worked out perfectly. Tomek Lewandowski, uh, the coach of, uh, of Marcin Lewandowski, also uh, says that the base is the most important thing in running. And if you can, just, you know, uh, do as much base as you can. And then you can start and, you know, the results of, of Marcin Lewandowski are extraordinary. So there is something uh, in it. Uh, but, you know, uh, I remember that you, I think you posted it on, on Strava, that you run uh, in uh, in Go Fert Park, yeah? Five, uh, 5K. Uh, it was uh, some some nice run that, that you ran uh, in pandemic, yeah? in, pa- in pa- pandemic period. Uh, how, you know, did it happen that you ran in park and it was just not normal race, but you ran, I think it was uh, like 13... 50 on 5k something like that yeah i can uh, i can explain it was 13 31 in the end but um there was this yeah this period without races um and then one of my friends uh, started this kind of movement where people did a race themselves and put it on strava and he started making standings and it became a real race but virtual so everybody ran by themselves um <clears throat> and when the when the track season started coming i wanted to do a bit more specific so just give my body some feeling like ah this is again how it feels to run fast Uh, so i went to my local park here there's a loop of 1250 meters um, and i joined in on the 5k and then i ran 30 minutes and 41 seconds uh, which was under the national record Um, and uh, then yeah a local race here a big race the save loop they said, well, you just ran a national record, but it's not official. Can we not make this official? So they decided to organize a really small race for just the elite of the Netherlands. This was end of July. Uh, so there was only 12 elites there on a Sunday morning, nine o'clock. So it was pretty early for me. But it was, yeah, it was such a nice initiative to race again. And everybody was so happy to be out there again and see each other again and do an actual race. Um, and then I actually officially broke the national record. Uh, again by running 1331 
So it, that was a bit the first race of my track season, even though it was on the road. But that was the yeah, just a good indicator for what was to come. And uh, yeah, it was just really special because it was a Sunday morning and we didn't have like bibs. And the people were walking their dogs on the Sunday morning and they just saw 12 guys running past at, uh, what is it, two, two, uh, 22k an hour. And yeah, it was, uh, was a special experience, but really cool. And after uh, this race, you knew that, you know, you are in good shape. And, you know, because then uh, there was uh, 13, 30 on 5,000 uh, meter, you know, the results that you ran in 2020 was just awesome. And uh, what happened that, you know, uh, what have you changed maybe that, you know, the 2020 was just a breakthrough for you? Well, I've been making steps like very graduate, like with the same trend for uh, a lot of years. So I've never had a year that I didn't improve, which is pretty special. But I know it. there's coming a year where I don't improve. I know it's coming, of course. But yeah, my coach is someone who doesn't like that young athletes train too hard. So I trained pretty easy when I was younger, but I was still performing with the best in the Netherlands. And we just slowly build up my mileage, slowly build up my training camps and just the whole lifestyle about uh, around being an athlete. But it was only until I really started doing altitude that I started making big steps. So I'm pretty lucky that they always say you have responders and non-responders to altitude. So the responders have a really big effect and non-responders have a small effect that just uh, biologically how your body works and i'm happy that i'm a really big responder so when you see me run at altitude you think this guy he's an amateur because i have so much problems with the the oxygen at, at altitude but when i come back i'm so much better than before i went there so that's one part of it but i really think that this long build-up uh, did me really good like i said before building a strong base and then going from that road 5k we just talked about i went to some moritz did l2 training started doing a bit more specific work and i just everything clicked everything was just right at exactly the right time i got into monaco diamond league the fastest track in the world people say yeah and everything just fell out of its place and uh, you were talking about your coach uh, joshua moles yeah Uh, how uh, have you become, uh, you know, a runner? Because when I think about Netherlands, I think about football and I think maybe about uh, ice skaters uh, and I don't think about runners. Okay, uh, there are some uh, some runners that I think of, of maybe Sivan Hassan or, or Daphne Shippers, but I don't think about uh, long um, distance runners. So... How uh, did you become a runner? Uh, how did it came from? Well, I actually was a football player as well because every little boy, like you say, in the Netherlands wants to be a professional football player. And I was the same. But the problem was I was not good with the ball. So when I didn't have the ball, I was really good because I was really fast. And they always put me on the midfield, just running forward and back and forward and back. I think that was a, the case for a lot of uh, distance runners. And then I think for school, we had to do... Uh, kind of sponsor run or like to collect money, run as many laps as you can. And then my parents saw mm, this, this guy maybe has some talent for running. So they put me on another race. I won that race. Yeah, of course, at that age, I was like seven years old. Uh, winning is really fun. So when you win something, that sport or that thing becomes fun. Uh, so I kept on doing these races, winning them. Uh, and then I decided to do athletics as well. So I was, doing football and athletics at the same time and i yeah i didn't really like athletics that much just some events like sprints i liked and like the longer running um and then i don't know why we decided to put me in the running group of joshua i think my my dad maybe heard about him and he already had this talent group um and then i i joined them for training and i just never left and we built such a good relationship now it's like yeah what is it 13 years later and i'm still running in the same group with the same coach and it's still working. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess you just, the, the main thing, of course, that you start liking what you do. Um, and for me, I think the winning in the beginning gave me some kind of love or some kind of feeling for the sport of liking it. And then at one point you start liking 
everything, or at least for me, uh, everything around it. So I can really look forward on a Sunday evening. I sit waiting for the Tuesday track session. I just look forward to it to put on my new spikes or put on a new racing kit or whatever. I, I can just enjoy that. And my coach is someone who gives the schedules pretty late. So just before it's raining. So you don't know what you're going to do, which is also pretty exciting and yeah, keeps it really fun. So yeah. And then, like I said before, this method of my coach in which um, you don't train too much when you're young, uh, of course, making progress every year keeps it fun. If you get injured or I, I, I of course, had some injuries, but um, if you if your progression is stopping, that's when it gets hard and less fun, I guess. And then you really need to show love for the sport to keep doing it. Uh, but for me, I was really fortunate in always having progression. You talk about uh, injuries. Uh, what main injuries uh, have you had during your career and, you know, maybe some uh, longer uh, periods that you couldn't run? Um, in 2017, uh, I built up my mileage a bit too quick. So I think I was running 90k before 2017 and then I suddenly started running 120k a week. And it was... I, I made a really big step that winter. So in the end of the winter, I won or I finished second in a really big cross country race in the Netherlands. But in that race, I felt something in my foot. Um, and with cool down, I tried tying my shoelaces, but it was it was painful on top of my foot. Um, so I thought, ah, some stiffness on my muscles there, or it's coming from my calf. So I went to the physio the next day, and we saw it was a bit purple and a bit red and swollen. So he said, I think it's something with your bone. So I made an MRI scan and it turned out to be a stress reaction in my, yeah, like in the middle of my foot. And that was the most serious injury I had that far. Like before that was, I twisted my ankle sometimes, took me like two weeks out, but never longer than two or three weeks. Um, and they said this would take eight to 12 weeks. So that was a bit of, of a shock for me. And that was also the first time. I think in those periods, you get to know yourself a bit better. Uh, like do I really want this am I gonna keep doing this because you know this won't be the the last time I will get an injury like this and I actually trained so hard in that period which made me realize I I really want this and not just by running but also by like running in a pool and sitting on a bike and I, I think I never trained as much as I did in those eight to ten weeks um, and I think that was the, the right mindset because uh, I started building up again um and that was the year the first year i could qualify for a european championship was under 23 in bitkos actually in poland i think i was running for three weeks so the first week was just minute runs then the second week i could do maybe 30 minute runs then the third week i tried some 200s on the track and in the fourth week i ran the standard uh, my pb was 344 and in that race i ran 342 and i was just like how is this possible and then i realized that in those injury periods you can still make a step if you work on your weak spots and that's exactly what I did uh, and then I yeah went to beat gosh but I noticed that that season the longer the season uh, was the worse I got because I didn't have this base we just talked about I just went like from zero to hundred real quick and then there was nothing of a base behind it so I couldn't keep that level for a long period but uh, yeah it was still uh, successful It is very interesting what you have just said because you didn't train for so long and still you managed to, to qualify for a European Championship. And I remember the same story about Marcin Lewandowski, uh, which he wrote in, in his book, book. And do you think that lots of uh, our potential and lots of our success depends on our head and you know on strong confidence that you are capable of of doing uh, such a crazy thing like you uh, you are doing on 5k or 10k uh yeah 100 it's also like i said i'm studying psychology so it's also what i'm uh, interested about and i'm actually writing a book about my own experiences uh in like mental strategies and those kind of things but it will probably take a while before it's finished uh, but it's just fun to write down my own thoughts um, and I've started to realize that running is was always seen as something they always said you have talent for running but it's not only about talent for running it's also about talent to be this like mental beast actually to go through certain things and uh, come back from uh, injuries and have the trust in yourself and 
I think that's where the most athletes actually drop off. It's not the physical level, but it's the mental level. And the mental is something it's something special because you cannot really see it, you cannot really grasp it. Uh, but there is possibilities to uh, to train it. And I think for like a for example a long injury period what's very important is that you work on your weak spots. So like we said, I thought because I didn't run a lot, I got uh, less good. But actually, in that period, I also did a lot of strength. I never did a lot of strength. I started working on the weak spots in my body. And basically, the total package of Mike that came out of the injury was stronger than the total package that went into the injury. Um, so I wasn't sitting doing nothing, but I built on my weak spots. And of course, if your mental is your weak spot, so you have problems with, um, for example, self-confidence, there's ways to train that and do that in that kind of period. And then I think also injury period can be a really good reset for the body because sometimes an injury is a signal from the body. Hey, you've been doing too much for a while, so you actually need that reset. Uh, maybe it's mentally, maybe it's physically, but either way, um, I think it can be good to have some kind of reset period like that. So not a. sometimes you take rest and sometimes you're forced to take rest by injury. Um, and it just... Yeah, the task of the athlete to make the most of that period and actually try to improve by being uh, while being injured. And what are your uh, weak spots? Physically, it was always my ass. And they always say the ass is a bit the motor of a runner because it's in the middle of the body and it steers the upper body, but also the legs. Uh, so I have had to do a lot of uh, exercise for that. And I still have a weak ass, actually. Um, it's still my weak spot in my body physically. Um, and also this injury in my uh, groin that I've had for a while, it's just everything around my hips is just not flexible and not all the small muscles there are not strong enough. So that's what I've been working on. But then again, they always say you're as weak as your uh, weakest link. So you can have your whole body perfect, but if your right big toe is, is weak, that's your weakest link. But then when you make this right big toe really uh, strong, then of course something else is your weakest link. So every few months I find something else like, oh, now this is strong, let's move on to the next part and then I find something else that's uh, that's weak. So in that way you can always improve and it's not only physical, but maybe uh, your food is your weak link. Maybe you eat like a lot of fats or whatever, uh, eat unhealthy and that's your weak link and when you fix that, you might find something uh, else. Uh, but I do really think that my mental part Uh, so my mental strength is one of the last things that I will see as a weakest link. I think I have, in general, a lot of self-confidence in myself, which is really important in running, uh, in any individual sports, of course. But yeah, uh, going to a start line, not feeling confident about yourself is the hardest thing there is, I think, um, and can make you very insecure. So for me, it's, it's mostly the, the physical parts that are my weak spot, I think. But then again, um. Some people say my body is made for running, so compared to others, I might have a stronger body. So it's hard to, it's really individual, that's what I'm trying to say. So really, everybody needs to find their own weak spot. And I get a lot of questions about what's your best, best exercise, and it's actually no good way to answer that because I can tell them my best exercise, but that exercise might be useless for them. So it's really about yourself, what you think is, um, yeah, is, is the best thing for you never-ending story with improvements uh, and what about your diet uh, because you also mentioned it uh, do you have some special food and special diets that uh, you need to you need to eat or just you know eat as much as you can this is something i've been starting to look into more the last two three years i, th I thought before when i was at like national level i didn't think it was that important or interesting but when you start becoming a more pro elite the whole lifestyle needs to become a bit more professional. Um, but let's start by saying that I'm not someone who's really extreme in anything. So I would never say I have to eat this or I have to eat this amount or I have to do this um, because I think that takes a lot of energy from me personally. So I just don't want to do that. So I try to be a bit more flexible. But then, uh, yeah, I do look after my food and I try to eat like the same amounts uh, every day or I mean the same amount of times every day. So not one day I ate twice and the other day I ate 11 times, but I always try to eat five or six times a day because that's just what feels nicest for my body. And then 
especially around training, I have some special things like after a harder workout or long run, I used to take a protein shake, which basically has a lot of carbs and proteins. So it's not just protein. After strength training, I would get some protein in. Usually before I go to sleep, I take some yogurt or something with extra protein with some powder maybe. In the morning, I'm pretty... That's maybe the only thing that I'm pretty stubborn about is my oatmeal in the morning because it gives me such a good base. I actually have it here standing next to me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just my body got so used to oatmeal that if I eat something else, I might have problems with my stomach. But like for dinner, it's not like I'm going to weigh my pasta and get exactly the right, the right amount in. I've, I've do started to create some rhythms, but also with that, it's very individual. Uh, you need to like the food first part. But also you, your body needs to respond well to it. And some people need to eat three hours before in workout. I can eat 15 minutes before and I don't have problems with my stomach. So it's very individual. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that you eat enough as a runner. Uh, keep track of your weight, uh, which I've started to do, especially where you go for more for altitude camps. You burn more, you have to drink more. Uh, then it's good to check your weight. And of course, it's all based on your feeling. Also, I got a, a question uh, from my friend who ran with uh, with you on European Championship in Bydgoszcz. Like uh, he said to me, you need to ask uh, Mike how does it how is it possible that he is so thin and he runs so fast and also uh, what is his uh, his bench press record? <laughs> I actually never do bench press. I, I I got this question a few days ago from a hurdler from the Netherlands also. <laughs> I, I should make a video one time where I try my max max bench press because then we all have the answer. No, I, I in my strength training I don't focus on like my arms a lot. Um, but I've, like I said before, I've, I I did start doing a lot more strength. Um, and strength for distance runner is so different from strength from a sprinter, for example. Like for me, strength can also be like rehabilitation exercises, which might seem like like with the elastic band. You probably saw videos about that, or you know about it. But that doesn't feel like real strength because you're not doing your big muscles, but you're training your small muscles. And that's for runners. That's also really important. Yeah, like I said, I found my weak spots and have a really good physio uh, who helps me with my exercises. And that's a bit the way I do my strength and, and got stronger. And then, again, this consistent training is the most important. Uh, you also mentioned that your mental is quite strong. And, um, you know, you are born with that or just uh, you work with a psychologist uh, or, you know, some, some other way that you now uh, can say that you are quite strong uh, at mental? Well, I think it's both parts. So, of course, partly you're born with it. Um, it's also the way I grew up. My sister used to be uh, like a professional gymnast. Uh, so she used to be out of the door at seven in the morning, come back 10 in the night. And I always envied her and I wanted the same lifestyle. My parents were always driving ar her around Europe. Uh, she actually did world champs in Poland also. So I've, I was there for her world champs first. It was a bit like in, in gymnastics, uh, the, the girl's career ends pretty young so when they're 18 or 20 it can end already so basically her career was ending and then my career was starting uh, now she quit gymnastics uh, totally and my career is like in in full swing still um, but it, I think that created or shaped my mental uh, strength in in a very good way because I had a good example and I saw how much h hard work it takes to achieve something um so that's how i learned but also my grandpa used to be a professional football player back in the day and i think it's also like uh, bio by uh, in the, in the biology of the body that it's uh, uh that you're born with it but then also uh in 2019 i had a really good year as well uh, i was i ran 13:25 over 5k and i was chasing the uh, world champ standard of 13:23 i was running so many races that i got like Uh, panic attacks because my body was so stressed from all the traveling i think i raced in dublin stayed there for three days then flew back had to leave the next day to roveredo italy and in the plane towards italy i got a panic at my first panic attack and i was like what's this um it was a very strange experience but in the same time i was still studying and i moved with my girlfriend to a new house so i just had a lot of stress on my body and it was something i didn't recognize 
and I was like, wait, I was mentally strong, right? Why, why am I getting panic attacks then? Um, and that made me realize that, yeah, there's imp- room for improvement for everybody. And then I actually saw a psychologist, like a normal psychologist. I think looking back at it, I would rather have had a, like a sports meant sports minded psychologist because they would have probably understood me better. But after four or five sessions, just getting my thoughts out and learning more about what panic attacks actually are, we concluded that it was, of course, the stress, um, but also discussed how to uh, handle those kind of things that would happen in the future. And of course, the higher level you get, the more pressure you get, the more stress you get on your body. So yeah, that was a special experience for me because like I said, I always thought mental problems I will never have. And I'm not the person who feels a lot of stress often. I'm not stressed about things so quickly, but still I developed this and I actually had problems with it for, with it for quite a while, uh, for like maybe a month or six weeks today. Yeah. In stressful situations like flying or sitting in a car or gave something in my body and yeah, the origin was, was mental. So I work with that and now I've never had problems with it again. So yeah, like I said, it's, it's partly born with it, but also something you can learn. What have you learned from, from this lesson, from this lesson, you know, some knowledge that you can uh, say, you know, to me, to, to my listeners uh, that, you know, can be, can be useful for us. This link between physical work and mental work is very close so i was thinking if i move to a new apartment and i carry a couch and a bed this is physical work it doesn't do anything to my mind so i'll probably be sore for a few days but i should be fine to race and then aside from it i was doing my thesis for my bachelor which is a lot of mental work but i always thought those things were separate so mental work is separate from physical work but it's all mixed so if you do a lot of physical work it also takes a lot from your mental. If you do a lot of mental work, it also takes a lot from your physical. And that's the main thing I learned from it, that if you do a lot of mental, physical training, racing, traveling, everything takes something from the mind. And you might feel as fit as you can in your body, but you can still have uh, yeah, like panic attacks and things that originate from the brain. Um, so that's the main lesson for me was that if I really want to go for running and I really want to do attempts for world champs and run a lot of races then i gotta cancel the rest and of course that's also different for people because some people can typically handle more uh, than other people Uh, but i realized that if i want to become professional elite i gotta stop having too much on the side Um, and i've become really good with that by saying no to something it's like i said it's different for everyone but for me it was a clear signal that um i should not have too much on the side um, which made me uh, after i finished my bachelor take a year off so i didn't study for a year uh, and that was the year leading up to 2020 so also the year i bit um, my breakthrough yeah i think that really helped me and then yeah the other aspects is of course that if you study you can normally loan money uh, and money is a big issue in running because there's not so much money in running if you compare it to other big sports uh, but I was fortunate enough to get a lot of sponsors and I also did a lot, put a lot of effort in that myself. Um, but that's, yeah, what, what made it happen that I could actually live like a pro athlete. And how do you manage with pressure before races, before, you know, I don't know, maybe some uh, diamond league, like 5,000 meter or also like championship nationals or European Well, I always think there's different levels and you go from level to level. So you start at like, what is it? Regional talent. People call you a regional talent. And then suddenly from regional talent, you go to nationals and you finish high at nationals being a junior and they say, oh, this is a national talent. And this is how you climb levels. And I noticed that the longer you are at such a level, the easier it gets. So every time you take a step up, the first race at that new level is always a bit yeah it gives more pressure gives more insecurities but then the longer you race at that level the easier it gets uh, so for example this year my first diamond league was monaco one of the biggest diamond leagues you can get in and this was a new level for me and i went to european indoors which was a high level but nothing compared to like this world stage and what helped for me was just sticking with my own plan so i was just focused on myself i was standing on the start line and i knew that Joshua Chapter guy over there, I was 
gonna try and break the world record but i was not even thinking about that i was just like i trained good i'm gonna try to run sub 13 20 i'm just gonna try and stay with this group for as long as i can and that's how i came through the race a bit and then once you had that first race then the next time you know oh the last time this worked so it's you learn from yourself but if you think back on it that first time you were that regional talent and you were allowed to compete at senior nationals you felt the same way because it was also a new level and you were also looking up to other elites so basically you've done it 20 times in your life before and why would you not be able to do it at this new level so when if i go to olympics i'll be at olympics i'll probably be so nervous but then i know i've done this like 20 million times so i should be fine and i think that gives some kind of security and confidence already and now i've been pretty steady at the level of diamond leagues or world indoor tours that it doesn't feel so uh, special anymore but say i make the final at in Togun at the europeans and i'm thinking i can make a i can take a medal that gives a new pressure that i've not been used to but i've been used to get this pressure for national uh, medals or titles when i was a bit younger so yeah it's the same thing just at a bigger scale you talk about um diamond league in monaco when you uh run 5000 meters it was just crazy race uh, and what was your experience and about this um, have you had fear that maybe you will run slower and joshua will uh, would uh, double you <laughs> well like i said it was my first diamond league so i didn't really know what to expect and i also didn't know so good what my level would be so it was hard to predict anything in that race uh, but i like i said before i just tried to focus on myself and I, i had no clue that joshua was even in the race at one point i was just focused on my group i was running with the europeans just trying to win my battles and that's the right, right way to race i think you're always racing against the guys from your level basically it was two different races in one race so i i didn't really notice that he was in the race but of course if If you look back on it, it was a really crazy race. And also for me, I equaled the national record there. So exactly the national record. And I remember standing there looking at the sign. And it's, it's like a big sign, but I couldn't really read it. And I just sat behind my name, like in brackets, it says, is national record. So I was like, does this mean it's a national record? Or does this mean this is the national record? Like exactly. I didn't remember what it was exactly. Yeah, of course, I was hoping... It would be just a national record, but then I realized it was exactly the same. But yeah, it was it was nice either way. Um, I didn't expect to run thirteen thirteen already then, so yeah, it was a really cool experience. But like I said, from Joshua's race, I didn't notice much. When I crossed the finish line, I saw my time, and I was looking for my time at the sign. I didn't even look at the first place, and then it was only fifty minutes after when I was like, "Why is not everybody congratulating me but that guy?" And then oh. Wait, he ran a world record. But of course, I think everybody should be like that and be with in their race with their own uh, performance. If I would be looking at him in the race, I would not have the right focus, I think. Uh, and uh, this is your biggest, I don't know if I can say that, uh, success of your career, this uh, this run. Because when I looked at your results, you know, um, the World Athletics says that Uh, 5,000 meters is even better than 5K. Uh, so what's your uh, opinion? Which uh, record is uh, the most important for you? That's a good question. I think the 5K on the road was just really special because it was in my hometown, like I said before, it's Sunday morning, just five minutes away from my house, which made it really special. But then the record, the performance itself, I think Monaco was a better performance, like running 13-13. Uh, and m more unexpected i would say so people knew this guy can run 13 20 or 13 18 but nobody was expecting me to break the national record not even myself um, and the national record from this weekend i expected it a bit and i knew other people also expected it a bit and then of course the surprise is less big um, so yeah for now definitely monaco with the whole experience being in monaco in a world record race running exactly the national record is of course uh, very special but then actually um, that race i was talking about earlier when i came back from my injury that might have been the most special race for my career still um, so the this, the most special national record was of course monaco but uh, in that race my grandma on, also died four days before so i came back from injury i trained for three or four weeks 
my grandma died. I buried my grandma the day before the race. And then in my hometown, town, also here in Nijmegen, with my dad on the track with tears in his eyes because he lost his mom a few days earlier. And then running a standard, my first European championship, that was felt way more special, like in front of a home crowd. Of course, in Monaco, there was not a lot of spectators and my family was not there. So the feeling was much more important and big back then in 2017. So that's that's for sure a race that will stay in my mind forever. Wow, wow very cool, uh, very cool story. Uh, coming to an end because it's almost uh, one hour. Uh, I got also a lot of questions that I need to ask you. What's your favorite uh, 5K trainings workouts? Uh, can you can you tell us how to run? You know, as fast as you. First, of course, that base is very important. Uh, so what I typically do is a lot of. A base threshold they call it base work uh, so f- say for example eight times 1k on the track or on a nice dirt road or wherever with maybe 400 meters jog in between or 200 meters jog in between and then for me it's like 305 300 pace nothing too fast just that you roll nicely and that's like a long period leading up to a 5k but then before a 5k I would typically do two specific workouts Uh, one of them is 400 meter repeats, uh, say for example, three times, four times 400, so three sets of four by 400. Uh, then the first set would be around 10k pace, the second set 5k pace, and the third set 3k pace. Yeah, that should feel quite, with, with pretty short rest, so like 100 meter jog or 200 meter jog. It depends a bit if you do it on altitude or not. So that's a bit of a training where you get used to the rhythm of, rhythm of running a 5k, and I just really like that it gets faster and faster towards the end. Um, and then 10 days before Monaco, I did a workout in Kiavenna. Uh, it's close to San Moritz, so you drive from the mountain, you drive down, you do a workout there. It was really, really windy that day. Um, actually, Marcin Lewandowski was joining me for the session, uh, and also his coach or his the guy who was there, he was biking. It was it was not Tomas, but it was someone else. I don't know who it was exactly. And we had like a nice train with some guys Uh, doing all my workout of or a part of my workout um, and then someone biking in front so it was really nice to be in that train and Marcin already said before the start ah I don't know if I'm gonna do the whole workout because the workout was uh, four by 1200 uh, in 240 per k uh, with that wind and then the the rest was only 400 meters jog so like two minutes maybe it was so windy that we were running like 28 and then like 34 or something uh per 200 because it was so windy but that was yeah so it was four by 1200 400 meter joke rest that was i think my best workout ever it gave me a lot of self-confidence for monaco and i think i averaged around 308 309 so that's 237 238 per k uh, but that's workouts i typically don't do too often because it's also a workout if you're already a bit tired that's the workout you're gonna get too tired from and you won't recover so i would never do that workout five days or four days before But I would always do it like 10 days before. So like uh, uh, you have the time to recover from it. And now before Levan, the 3000 meters last week, I did four by 1K. And then it was the first 400 pretty easy. Uh, so say 10K pace. And then the last 600 fast. So 1500 meter pace, 3000 meter pace. And that, that I did that five days before the race. So it was a bit tight. But because I was the altitude before, I wanted to do something specific to get used to the sea level again. So I I like doing 1Ks, 1200s, with not too long rests, say max two minutes, uh, and then at race pace, something like that. I think that's also what most people do, like most 5K runners, as a as a hard workout. I also saw that after race, uh, you also run like five times three minutes. What was uh, the point of, uh, of this training? Well, I only do that if I actually feel good after the race. So sometimes you have a race where you just have to sit down and you cannot do anything anymore, then I would not do it. But I felt so fresh in the body that I was jogging at first for 10 minutes. And then I wanted to get rid of the lactate. So uh, I felt my whole body was just a bit stiff from that race. And like I said, the first race at the altitude always feels a bit rusty and a bit stiff. So then it's nice to get your rhythm back and in the same uh, time train a bit again. Because this was not the most important race of the season. So you also want to get a good training effect from that race, from that race. And especially distance runners are sometimes a bit autistic with their training. So they want a certain amount of case. I'm not 
that autistic that I really want that. But I think it's good to make out of a race also a good workout. And that was the point of it. And also uh, the point was uh, that, you know, when you are on uh, Olympic or, you know, European Championship, like, I don't know, there are three days and two races. And also it is, uh, you know, to simulate uh, this uh, this event. You know that if it is, if a race is not heavy, another race might be really heavy. So like a 3000 on the track is often not that much impact for the body. But a 10,000 on the track can be a lot of impact. So if you do some, make it some longer workout or some longer training, uh, I think you prepare yourself for like these bigger races. And you stay. In, I noticed I stay in a certain rhythm if I do this. So if I would not do this five times three minutes after the race, I would probably still be really stiff today. So like three days after. But because I did that workout, I got the legs going again and made my like my mind and my body believe that it was actually just a heavy workout and not a all out race. And then you stay in some kind of rhythm. But at a really important race, so let's say the 5,000 meter end of the month, I would never do that. Or maybe as a punishment training, no. <laughs> Mike, it was really a pleasure uh, to talk with you. Uh, you know, you said lots of uh, clever words, especially about uh, about psychology and, you know, physically uh, stuff in our in our body. So thank you very much. Uh, good luck in Torun. Uh, good luck with this Monaco meeting. I hope that you will uh, you will run a uh, standard and you will I will uh, see you uh, in TV uh, when you will start uh, in uh, in Tokyo. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a good time and uh, and see you soon. Okay.